Greetings, folks, and welcome to our little jaunt into the English of South Africa. My plan for this week, by the way, is to do three shorter lectures rather than two regular length ones, as regular as they've been, because of course we've only spent one day on the Southern Hemisphere and it really deserves more than that, so I'll be talking about South African English today. Then I want to follow up with another lecture on English around the world, or global English if you prefer, and then finally a bit of a wrap-up for the exam because, of course, this is the final week of the class. My plan is to have all three of those up by Thursday evening. And, of course, although there are officially no classes on Friday, I will be available for a tutorial at our usual time at 12.30, if anyone wants to drop in. For references to speech patterns, I've provided a couple of links here, which I've also posted to the Moodle page. And as the links are posted well before the lecture is actually going up, I expect that you'll have had a chance to listen to them before listening to this lecture. If you haven't, please do so now, and then you'll have some idea of what we're actually talking about. One is a comparison of general South African and Australian accents, and the other is an example of the broad South African accent. In terms of history, I've already said a bit about it in past lectures, but just to recap, the Cape Colony was settled by the Dutch in 1652 and taken by the British in 1806. In 1820, the first wave of immigrants arrived, mostly a working class population, but also some middle class. And what this means effectively is that while several of the elements that inform Australian and New Zealand English coming out of, for example, Cockney are present in South African English, but due to the middle class presence, not quite as noticeable. The reason for the large middle class population is that the settlement pattern was actually quite different. There was less a matter of mass colonization, although colonization did happen. There was also a pattern of management and overseeing. And as we discussed in past lectures, this pattern leads to different language development patterns as well. But of course, the Dutch were there before the English. Their language, Dutch, which became the language of Afrikaans, also exerts an influence on South African English. We'll talk about that in a bit. Moving forward a few decades, during the 1840s and 1850s, settlement started at a new colony, the Natal, which is along the coast but to the north and east of the Cape. Settlement here was independent of settlement from the Cape and largely came out of northern England. So here as well, the Cockney elements are largely absent and this also contributes to the lack of these elements in the general South African dialect. But of course, we can't tell the story of South Africa without also mentioning something of the Boer Wars. In 1877, the British annexed the Transvaal, which was an area occupied by, by the Boers, by the descendants of Dutch settlers. The reason for this annexation in 1877 was the discovery of large deposits of diamonds in 1867, so 10 years prior and the subsequent development of a diamond industry, for which, of course, South Africa is still known. The Boers didn't take kindly to being occupied by the British, so they, of course, rebelled in 1880. And the First Boer War basically fought over diamonds, because the British wanted them, lasted for approximately four months, after which Britain conceded self-government to the Transvaal and well, it looked for a while like everybody would be happy, except for you notice that Boer Wars is in the plural. And, of course, by everybody being happy, what I most expressly don't mean is the indigenous Africans. As it was the Treaty of Pretoria that concluded the First Boer War that instituted the system of racial segregation that in 1948 would become known as apartheid. Oh, I should also note, perhaps, that 
with Canadian Confederation being in 1867, the Boer Wars were the first wars in which Canadian troops fought as Canadian troops. Though I believe this didn't actually occur until the Second Boer War, which we're about to discuss. As for the Second Boer War, fought between 1899 and 1902, this too was fought because the British wanted something that the Boers had. First time around it was diamonds, this time around it was gold. And as they were flexing their muscle in the area against the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, both of them Boer republics, the Boers decided that they'd had enough of British meddling and attacked the British. This was basically a guerrilla war, which the British won, but ended up offering very generous terms to the Boers in the peace treaty that followed. Following the conclusion of the war, it didn't take too long for the Union of South Africa to form from the four former colonies, two Boer colonies of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, and two British colonies of the Cape Colony and the Natal. South Africa was recognized as a self-governing dominion in 1910 with the official languages of English and Dutch, with Dutch later being replaced by Afrikaans. The racial segregation was redefined as apartheid in 1948, and in 1961 South Africa became a republic. Following a long series of coordinated protests and other social actions, Apartheid finally came to an end in 1990, and in 1994, South Africa had its first democratic elections with full adult enfranchisement. I mention this because it actually has a lot to do with the development of the English language in South Africa, to which I think it's now time we turn. As for the English of South Africa, very much like the English of Australia and of New Zealand, there are three social registers, refined, general, and broad. And as in Australia, the refined dialect is spoken by the upper class. It indicates cultural authority, education. It's very similar to received pronunciation and like the refined accent in Australia, refers or appeals to RP for its authority. As for the general dialect, this is originally based on the accent of Natal, so it was originally a regional dialect, but has since become a middle-class sociolect. Rather than appealing to received pronunciation for its usages, as the refined accent does, this appeals to South African usages. So in that sense, it is a more South African accent than the refined accent. And it's spoken by a majority of white Anglophone South Africans. As in Australia, it's currently expanding at the expense of both the broad and refined accents. And it is associated with upward social mobility. This goes back to its being originally an accent associated with the middle class, even when it was the regional dialect of the Natal. The first clip that I posted to the Moodle page will give you a sense of what this accent actually sounds like. I'm not going to take this one apart the way I've taken apart the last few accents that we've looked at, simply as a matter of time. There are other things I want to get through this week, and this is our last week of class. My purpose in this lecture is to just give you a sense of how English functions in South Africa and point you toward places where you can hear it spoken. As for the broad South African accent, which you can hear in the second clip that I posted to the Moodle page, this is generally spoken by the working class. It is a white dialect, as are the other two that I've mentioned, and it's based on the English of the Cape Colony. But very much as the Natal accent has become the accent more or less of the middle class, that is, it's become a sociolect, the Cape accent has become a working class sociolect. It's spoken by Anglo South Africans who have a lot of contact with the Afrikaners, that is, the descendants of the Boers, and tends to be spoken as well by the Afrikaners who have English as a second language. Prior to 1994, 
it was a very common dialect, but it's been on a decline since then. You'll remember that apartheid ended in 1990, and free and fair elections have been practiced in South Africa since 1994. The broad South African dialect is a pretty reliable indicator of nationalism, particularly white nationalism, conservatism, low education, and hostility to indigenous Africans, uh, or in other words, racism. Its cultural associations in South Africa are actually very similar to the cultural associations of a rural Deep South accent in the United States, and largely for the same reasons. Apartheid and segregation were basically just two versions of essentially the same policy. And the mindsets of white supremacy are deeply ingrained still in certain elements of both cultures. But as I said, since free elections began in 1994, the broad dialect has been on the decline. There have also been a lot of really interesting other developments in South African English since the fall of apartheid. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I think we should probably go back first to 1948 to pick up the story there and discuss the role that English has played in South African society broadly, even those many elements of South African society that don't have English as a first language. I think you might be surprised by this part of the story. So how does English work in South Africa? Well, We've talked a lot about English being a colonial language and thus a language of colonial oppression over the last little while, but the truth is this is only part of the picture. From 1948 until the end of apartheid in 1990, and right up to the beginning of democratic elections in 1994, English was the language of opposition in South Africa, as opposed to Afrikaans, which was effectively the language of oppression. The African National Congress, whose initial mission was to fight apartheid, and of course that after the end of apartheid became one of the most important political parties in South Africa, adopted English as its official language. The reason for this is that the various other languages spoken by black South Africans were in many cases mutually incomprehensible, and English served as a lingua franca that didn't have the disadvantage of privileging one or another of the indigenous languages against all of the others. In that sense, it came to function very much as, as Latin functioned during the Middle Ages, as an essentially foreign language and not the native language of the speakers in question, but a means of mutual communication and understanding without privileging one culture or one culture group above the others. As for the situation right now, which dates to about 1994, there are 11 official languages in South Africa, as opposed to just the English and Afrikaans, which had been the, the official languages under apartheid. These, of course, remain official languages, but in addition to them are nine indigenous languages, thus giving a much more realistic portrait of the actual populace of the country. And speaking of language patterns across the country, if we take a look at native languages by percentage of population, we find that all of a sudden we're looking at a very different environment than we have been with any of the other countries or cultures that we've looked at where English is spoken. There is no majority language in South Africa. The most commonly spoken first language is Isi Zulu at 23.8% of the population. Next up is Isi Shosa with 17.6% of the population. And only in the third position do we have a colonizer or European language, Afrikaans, at 13.3% of the population. Sapedi then comes in at 9.4%, and finally, Tying for the fifth spot, with 8.2% each, we have English and Setswana. This is a very different dynamic than we saw, for example, in Australia or in any of the other colonial environments that we've explored over the last few weeks. 
And just looking at these numbers, you might actually be tempted to think that English is, in fact, not all that important in the overall context of South African culture. But you would be mistaken in that opinion. Here's why. When we take into account speakers whose first language is not English, we find that English is actually spoken by 45% of South Africans. This includes, of course, white native speakers but it also includes African ESL speakers, many Afrikaners, in fact most, and the ethnic Indian and Chinese communities as well, both of which are generally bilingual, speaking one or the other of the native languages of the culture from which they're descended, and English. So once again, we find that as with the adoption of English by the ANC, English here serves as a useful lingua franca among many communities who otherwise might find it very difficult to communicate with each other. And you might ask, why not Afrikaans? Because native-speaking Afrikaners outnumber native-speaking Anglophones considerably. The answer here goes back to the politics of race and the association of apartheid specifically with the Afrikaner culture and of English with political resistance and reform. That is, English in South Africa, particularly the general accent, tends to be associated, as I've already mentioned, not just with upward mobility, but with political progressiveness. Whereas Afrikaans, very much as a number of Deep South accents in the United States, tends to be associated with both cultural and educational backwardness. Along with its being a means of communication across disparate cultures, English is also a mandatory school subject, largely because it is such an important international language and the language in which most of the government's business is actually conducted. It's also the official language of instruction in many schools, both primary and secondary and post-secondary and in fact is a language of instruction for many Africans above third or fourth grade. And here, this has to be understood as a compromise. That is, students have the right to be educated in any of the official languages of the country that happen to be their native language. But often, it is impossible to have the requisite expertise available in every given school, in every given language. And sometimes it simply can't be found at all above the primary level. So English is the default. And it is a default, as I said, for largely pragmatic and political reasons. It is, and has been since 1948, the language of social advancement, particularly among people whose culture is not initially Anglophone culture and most definitely among anyone who wants to have a career that reaches outside of the boundaries of South Africa. On a related note, it's worth pointing out as well that English is currently gaining ground over Afrikaans. And this is not to say anything against Afrikaans as a language. I actually happen to think it's a very interesting language. But it is not an international language. And in the areas of technology, international commerce, and of course diplomacy, English is far more useful. We can say this without making a single value judgment. So as I said, anyone interested in a career that not just extends beyond the boundaries of South Africa, but that engages the broader world even from within the country's boundaries, pretty much has to learn English. So what we're getting here is a situation that actually has considerable overlap with the international picture, which we'll be discussing in our next lecture. But of course, as I said, English in South Africa is very much its own dialect. So what I'd like to do for these last few slides is look at a couple of details that make it specifically South African. At first, I'd like to look at a few of what are called false friends. There's a larger selection of these in one of the handouts that I posted to the Moodle page. A false friend is 
a word that is familiar from everyday standard English, but that has taken on a particular and sometimes really kind of odd or startling meaning, quite different from its original meaning in a given dialect, and these can often give rise to genuine misunderstandings and miscommunications. One, and I find this one quite entertaining, is China, which is neither ceramics nor a very large country, but actually a term that refers to a friend. This is a holdover from Cockney rhyming slang, in which a China plate is your mate, and following the usual pattern, the rhyming element is simply dropped and the non-rhyming initial element is kept. So it's not just the Australians who have maintained some element of this tradition. The rhyming slang habit or tradition isn't as active or productive in South Africa as it is in Australia, but you can still see some fossilized remnants of it. Another false friend is now now which is not something you say as in now now to calm somebody down, but rather an informal expression meaning soon or in a bit. That is, dinner will be ready now now. Another couple of interesting examples are robot and Tom. A robot is a traffic light. This term comes from a description of early traffic lights as robot policemen. And I actually kind of like the idea of robots standing on the corners and telling people when they, when they can drive and when they can't. It's both a nice science fiction-y image and to many people an outright dystopia. But in South Africa, it's just a day. And as for Tom, this is neither a drum nor a boy's name, but yet another throwback to Cockney rhyming slang, where... Tom is a short form of tomfoolery, which is a rhyming slang term for jewelry. And Tom, in this case, then, is money or cash. And as I said, you can find a few more of these in one of the handouts on the Moodle page. I think you'll find them interesting. At least I hope so. You probably won't be surprised to know that South African English, aside from having some unique usages taken from Standard English or other dialects, also borrows quite liberally from other languages. It's taken several words, for example, from Afrikaans, although interestingly, the pattern of borrowing from Afrikaans has come virtually to a stop since about 1994, after which borrowings from indigenous languages are a lot more common. And the reasons for this are precisely the politics that I've already discussed with you. In any case, though, here are a few from Afrikaans, and you can find a larger list, of course, on the handout. But it might be nice to just have a couple in the lecture as well. One is dof, which, which means stupid, as in you're so dof. This comes from an Afrikaans word that means dull. And when I encountered this one, I was struck by a similarity with a slang term that was popular in the punk culture of London in the 1970s, duff, which is a way you could describe a band that was boring or dull or just not really part of the scene. I'm not sure whether there's an etymological link here, but where there is definitely an etymological link is the term dorp for village. You may recall that English has taken the word thorpe, which means basically village, from Old Norse. These two are cognate, and they go back to common Germanic. Another fun one is dop, which can be both a noun and a verb. That is, it is an alcoholic drink or drinking alcohol. And this isn't terribly unusual in itself. We kind of do the same thing with the word drink, or at least something very similar. And as for dwal, and I love the double A in Dutch and Afrikaans, this refers to a lack of concentration. So, sorry, say that again, I'm in a bit of a dwal. I need to remember that one. I think it could come in handy sometimes. And as long as we're on the topic of double A's, one of my favorite words in the English language actually originally comes from Dutch or Afrikaans, and that is aardvark, which translates directly into earth pig. Aard is cognate with earth, and vark is cognate with pork. <laughs>
so pig. So initially, this is a very descriptive word. But I digress. Perhaps I'm in a bit of a dwell. A couple more borrowings from Afrikaans that it would be really remiss of me not to mention are trek and welt. A trek, of course, which has entered standard English, is a slow and difficult journey originally coming from Afrikaans trek, in turn from Dutch trekken, and can be traced right back to Proto-Germanic trikana or trakjana, and even further back to Proto-Indo-European dreg, to drag or scrape. And in fact, that's the same etymology that we have for drag and draw and tract and tractor. Tract and tractor, of course, coming at us through Latin rather than through Germanic. So that Proto-Indo-European root has been very, very productive as far as the English language is concerned. As for Welt, this is cognate with field. It's effectively the same word, and it means a field, basically, or at least that's what it means in Dutch. In Afrikaans and in South African English, it means an open, uncultivated country, basically the South African equivalent of a prairie. So once again, we have a, an, in, an interesting story of two words, Welt and field, cognate, that is sharing a common ancestry, and yet coming to have distinct functions within a given dialect. But these borrowings are all a little on the old side. As I said, South African English is no longer really borrowing from Afrikaans. It's mostly borrowing from indigenous languages. And it's to these that I'd like to turn for one final glimpse in our little snapshot of South African English. The first such word I'd like to look at is donga, from the Nguni word udonga, meaning wall. But in South African English, this means a dry gully or a ditch. Now, I find this kind of curious because, as I think we discussed back in the Old English section of the course, the words for dike and ditch in English, which go back respectively to Old Norse and Old English, also share a common etymology. So we have in English a word that means ditch, which is also related to the word for dig, becoming a wall, a dike, while here we have in a completely different language a word meaning wall becoming something like a ditch, a reverse process, in a completely different environment. I didn't even realize that that was the case when I selected this word to include in the slideshow. It just occurred to me now as something worth mentioning. Another nice one, and this one comes from the Zulu Ugogo, is gogo, meaning grandmother, which is a polite form of address for any elderly woman. And I do quite like when family words come to have non-family associations. This happens in a lot of other cultures as well with different words and different relationships, of course. It's a nice way of recognizing the commonality that we have with people around us. There's something similar in Korean. Ajuma means aunt. That is A-U-N-T, aunt. And this is a polite form of address to any older woman, significantly older woman, whom you don't happen to know. And of course, people in labor unions will often speak about their brothers and sisters in the union. But moving on to another Zulu word, this one meaning a matter for discussion, we have indaba, which in South African English refers to a meeting or conference or discussion. And here I think we really see the, uh, the effect of English being a lingua franca among multiple language groups, particularly during a period of resistance. That's exactly the context in which this word would have entered the language. That is, the word itself is a linguistic remain, a, re a linguistic reminder of the struggle against apartheid. That is to say, the struggle for racial justice against a deeply ingrained culture of white supremacy or white nationalism. I mentioned earlier in the course that every word tells a story, and the story of this word is a very hopeful one, and in this year in particular, I think a good one to bear in mind, because it illustrates that that struggle can be won.
And as a final note, we'll just take a look at a few more here. There's Inyanga, meaning a traditional herbalist healer coming from Nguni. And coming from Zulu, we have Bakoti coming from Umakoti, meaning a bride or a daughter-in-law. And we have Muti coming from Umuti, meaning medicine, typically traditional medicine. Now, if we take a look even at the relatively small list of words I've given you here coming out of various indigenous languages, and recall our comparison of words drawn from various colonized areas, India, Africa, North America, and the spheres of life to which they referred, or to which they refer, then even in this little list of six words, which I did not choose with this conclusion in mind, we have a pretty good range. We have a couple of family words. We have a couple of medicine words that are used non-ironically. There is a landscape word and a word referring to matters of basically official business. That's not a bad range, and it suggests a very different relationship to the indigenous languages than we saw or see in words coming out of other colonized areas in the past, when the English speakers were the colonizers, the ones with explicit power. Here we see a different relationship and English being used in a different way, and a really, I think, more equitable range, if equitable is the right word, and I'm not really sure that it is, of words and word categories coming into the language in South Africa. This is very encouraging, I think, and it probably says a lot about what we can expect for English on the whole moving forward, as it arguably has probably by this point crested or passed its heyday, given that it has been the language of two successive empires and the second of which is currently visibly in decline. But I'll leave that speculation for the next talk. For now though, brief though this exploration of South African English has been, I'm going to stop talking and edit it as I had hoped to have it posted a while ago. And the plan is to post uh, a brief talk about international English, probably tomorrow evening, tomorrow being Wednesday, and then a final review session, trying to draw things together and see what picture emerges sometime on Thursday. So I hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much. And for those of you who will be coming to our optional tutorial session on Friday, I do look forward to speaking with you. Bye for now.